You want answers? I think I'm entitled. You want answers? I want the truth! You can't handle the truth! You may not be able to handle the truth, but these guys can. Welcome to the Long for Truth Show. Heretic hunters. Hey, what do you think of these guys? I think they're damned and on their way to hell, and I don't think there's any redemption for them. You stink, frankly. That's the way I think about it. Hello, and welcome to the Long for Truth Show. My name is Dan Long, and on this episode of Long for Truth, we're going to be talking about heavenly trips. Stick around. A lot of talk these days about trips to heaven. A lot of people writing books, even making movies about trips to heaven. The question is, are these trips real? Are they real experiences, or are they just something that, um, well, the mind has just kind of fabricated or has just kind of uh, made up? Perhaps these folks were under some kind of uh, hallucination or something like that. That's the question, because you have to ask... Do the experiences of these people, no matter how sincere they are, do their experiences match Scripture? And that's what we're going to be talking about on this episode of Long for Truth. Now, what I am pleased to announce is that I actually had a a nice discussion about this with my brother Steve today. Yes, Steve will be joining me on the podcast through Skype. Steve lives in Elizabeth City, North Carolina. I live in upstate New York. When we originally decided to do this podcast in October of 2012, we did the first two shows together. I was actually visiting in Elizabeth, down in Elizabeth City. And um, so the first two podcasts we did, we did together. Of course, when, uh, we, when I came back, we had to figure out how we were going to continue to do this. And we decided it would be through Skype. And well, it just hadn't been – we hadn't been able to be consistent. Our schedules wouldn't um, jive or something would come up. And so it's been really difficult to be consistent to get with Steve on a weekly basis. So we both decided, well, we'll get together when we can. And then, um, you know, if whenever we can do a podcast together, uh, we'll do it. But in the meantime, we'll both of us will just do solo podcasts. And so that's what kind of what we've been doing. But – He joins me today, and he is not with me now on the intro because we use a Skype program uh, to record uh, our our conversations. So uh, one of the things I want you to keep in mind as you listen to this podcast is you're going to hear a a humming sound in the background. And it's going to sound, well, it might be a little distracting. I I think it was Steve had his fan going uh, uh, at the house and uh, I think that's what you he- what you're hearing. But it almost sounds like he's outside, uh, and, and he's in his in his car or something. But he's not. Uh, he's he he's in his home, and I think he had his fan running. So that that's going to be the noise that you hear in the background. Anyway, I think we had a productive, and uh, very helpful conversation. And so, without any further ado, here is uh, my conversation. My com- blah, 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 if I can speak right, my conversation with my brother Steve Long. Well, Steve, it is good to have you back on the podcast. It's good to be able to do a podcast with you. We haven't done one in a few weeks. Yeah, it's good to be back. And uh, we uh, both, I think the last one we did was the anti-Calvinist rant. That was from, it. Uh, I want to say, was it? The, I keep thinking the Naked Pastor, but that was another one I did. That was from Pathios.com. Exactly. Right, right. And... Uh, Five reasons why Calvinism makes me want to gouge my eyes out. And uh, so, should we call this one five reasons why heaven experiences want to make us gouge our eyes out? Yeah, we could do something like that. I don't know if the title is too long or not, but uh, <laughs> no, I wouldn't do that. 
I would do that. But Steve, I, well, one of the reasons we're together uh, today, I know we uh, we just uh, uploaded a podcast on Thursday. Uh, Jack Hayford. Yep, on uh, Jack Hayford's battle plan. But we, you and I together doing this podcast, I think it's really important because of all of the all of the talk about the new movie Heaven is for Real. And um, you know, we, one of the things that um, uh, as Christians we have to do is we have to be always be ready and prepared to give an answer for those who ask us about such things as this. And I've already been asked about this movie at work. Um, have you had anybody talk to you about this movie at all or ask you questions about it since it's so popular? I have not, believe it or not. Uh, I've heard people talk about it, but nobody has directly asked me uh, my opinion about it. And it's probably a good thing. Sometimes I have a tendency to come off as a little harsh. Yeah, yeah, so do I. So don't feel bad. And I think I might have actually uh put some put the person that asked me about it off a little bit but my my whole point and and um in the discussion i had with this person which was at work by the way uh my whole point in having this discussion my my whole point in talking to this person was to try to you know let them know that the scripture trumps experience and that's the most important thing i mean these, these people like colton burpo and Don Piper and others who have uh, claimed to have experiences uh, where they have gone and visited heaven, they may be sincere, but the big question is, is do, does their experience match with Scripture? And if it doesn't, are we going to believe them because they're very sincere people, or are we going to believe the Bible? I think that is the crux of really not just this issue, Danny, but any any issue dealing with something that contradicts the Bible. And I've said this before on a thousand other podcasts, and I'll say it again, and I'll keep saying it. Christians, or, or professing Christians, that is, are throwing away the sufficiency of Scripture for either some kind of experience or in order to be more relevant to the culture. And there's several reasons for that. I think the big reason is um, because experience is here and now. It's something that I actually have happened to me. The Bible itself, well, you know, it's kind of it's 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 a book, and it you know it's it's kind of it's it's hard to understand, and it's hard to read, and it takes work to dig in. I think that's one reason. But then the other reason is the pastors in the pulpit are not holding up Scripture. Um, very high, are they? They're, they're actually, uh, they, they, they actually have quite a low view of Scripture. Yeah, I think many, many pastors do. Either that, or in order to uh, not offend people, they will not uh, probably harp on things that actually they should be harping on. And I've noticed just this trend among Christians who are professing evangelical Christians of how the pendulum is just swinging uh, to the other side of some of these social issues, such as homosexual marriage, uh, you know, these so-called Christian bands, Christian singers coming out of the closet as being gay, and the Christian world is applauding them. And, yeah. you know, it's like, where are the people that are behind the pulpits, why are they not speaking out? I mean, people are speaking out, but it seems like less and less of them. Well, you know, with with the uh, issue of, of homosexual marriage um, and pastors now kind of um, embracing this idea, not all pastors, of course, and I don't mean that, I, I'm not trying to, you know, lump every single church and every single pastor into this category, but a big majority of pastors in these in, in, in these big churches and, and even these prominent pastors are not, uh, again, not opening up the Word of God and saying, look, the Word of God says that, uh, that, that homosexuality is a sin. The Word of God says that uh, marriage is between a man and a woman. And it, 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 like I said, it, it's, it seems to be that so many pastors are kind of, you know, just pushing the scriptures aside or have a very low view of scripture altogether. And so that's why people, their people, uh, elevate experience over uh, the scriptures, I think. I mean, at least that's one reason, in my opinion. 
Well, also, too, uh, and, and Pastor Carlton McLeod put it very well last week, professing Christians are trying to redefine what Scripture means on certain topics. And I think these, quote-unquote, experiences of heaven and hell and the spiritual world and all these other things, I think that's just a big part of it. It's, it's a combination of the lack of sufficiency of Scripture, putting Scripture to the side for experience, and reinterpreting Scripture to mean what we need it to mean in order to match our experiences. All right, well, let's let's talk right now about biblical experiences of heaven versus non-biblical experiences of heaven. And I right. know that um, one of the things that really bothers me about, oh, Carlton Burpo's experience in Heaven is for Real, Colton, I called him Carlton, Colton Burpo's experience in uh, the book Heaven is for Real, and Don Piper's experience and others like them, is that... Um, they, they don't match with Scripture. I, I think about the Apostle Paul's experience and how the Apostle Paul himself would not was not even allowed to come back and express the things that he saw or or you know talk about the things that he saw while he was there. Steve, do you have that passage right up uh, right right in front of you? Yep, I sure did. Why don't you read that passage and let's talk about that for a moment before we uh, talk about uh, Colton Burpo's experience. Okay, it's 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 1 through 4. And just to set a little bit of the context, Danny, Paul is kind of rebuking the Corinthians for their misuse of spiritual gifts, uh, for their really for their pride of boasting about visions and other apostles who claim to have had visions. And, and, and they were kind of putting the apostle Paul on the on the outskirts because, hey, he wasn't a quote-unquote real apostle. He didn't have all these other experiences. And Paul rebukes this idea beginning in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 1. He says, I must go on boasting. Though there is nothing to be gained by it, I will go on to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago was caught up to the third heaven. Whether in the body or out of the body, I do not know. God knows. And I know that this man was caught up into paradise, whether in the body or out of the body. I do not know. God knows. And he heard things that cannot be told, which man may not utter. Second Corinthians 12, 1 through 4. All right, so let's compare that experience that the Apostle Paul had. Now, what goes through my mind as I'm, as I'm listening to you read that, is here is the apostle himself, the author of 13 books of the New Testament, who God did not allow to come back and 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 speak about his experience. The apostle himself, and yet you can have well, you can have a, a four-year-old boy visit heaven and do things like sit on Jesus's lap and um, tell his father and the world that everyone there has wings and you you know and, and all these other things uh, talk about a f uh, watching a fight with uh, with Satan and uh, Jesus not giving him a sword because uh, he'd be too dangerous with a sword and all this other kind of just bizarre stuff and I know you know I'm not trying to to uh, mock this uh, you know this this four-year-old's experience but it just, when you think about the fact that the Lord did not even allow the Apostle Paul himself to describe his experiences, why would that, why would God allow a four-year-old boy or even Don Piper or, you know, so many others go there, come back, and relay their experiences? Which, by, which, by the way, none of them, uh, none of the experiences really match each other. You know what I mean? Uh, they've they've all had different experiences that don't seem to jive together. Well, hey, you know, you got a four year old, you got a grown adult. I mean, they would have different experiences, right? Yeah. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, but Danny, I, one of the things that really uh kind of clicked with me as I was watching the Don Piper uh, video, you know, the uh, the four part interview right. with Don. Uh. Colton Burpo, or at least his dad, is that these men are pastors. They are teachers 
of the word of God. And that's kind of scary that they would get something wrong as vital as being eternity with God. Yeah. Let's, um, I, I've got a, um, I've got a page up from the book, Heaven is for Real. This is on page 62. And uh, I want to read a conversation that uh, Todd Burpo had with his son. And uh, let's talk about that. All right. So we're on page 62 of the book, Heaven is for Real. And this is where it says, remember, this is Todd. um, I believe this is Todd talking here, the boy's father. Remember when we were in the car and you talked about sitting on Jesus' lap? Still on his knees, he looked up at me. Yeah. Well, did anything else happen? He nodded, eyes bright. Did you know that Jesus has a cousin? Jesus told me his cousin baptized him. Yes, you're right, I said. The Bible says Jesus' cousin's name is John. Mentally, I scolded myself. Don't offer information. Just let him talk. I don't remember his name, Colton said happily, but he was really nice. John the Baptist is nice. Just as I was processing the implications of my son's statement that he had met John the Baptist, Colton spied a plastic horse among his toys and held it up for me to look at. Hey, Dad, did you know Jesus has a horse? A horse? Yeah, a rainbow horse. I got to pet him. There's lots of colors. Lots of colors? What was he talking about? Where uh, where, uh, where are there lots of colors, Colton? In heaven, Dad. That's where all the rainbows, rainbow colors are. That set my head spinning. Suddenly I realized that up to that point I'd been toying with the idea that maybe Colton had some sort of divine visitation. Maybe Jesus and the angels had appeared to him in the hospital. I'd heard of similar phenomena many a times when people were... Uh, as near death as Colton had been. Now it was dawning on me that not only was my son saying that he had left his body, he was saying he had left uh, the hospital. You were in heaven, I managed to ask. Well, yeah, Dad, he said, as if that fact should have probably or should have been perfectly honest or obvious. So anyway, got an experience here where uh, Colton meets John the Baptist and... G, and, you know, Colton gets to pet Jesus' rainbow-colored horse. Nothing like that in Scripture at all. And yet what boggles my mind is that Christians, and I know of Christians, eat this stuff up. And I go back to this. Do we believe experience, no matter how sincere a person is, or do we believe Scripture? Yeah, well, the first thing that crossed my mind was uh, when the Scripture talks about Jesus having a horse, it was actually a white horse, yeah. not a rainbow-colored horse. Uh, but then again, you know, when you got a four-year-old that's under heavy anesthesia, they're probably going to see a lot of things, at least I would imagine. Well, you know, I, I think about those who have maybe not have actually visited heaven, but have had experiences where they actually saw the Lord. And what almost every single time in the scriptures that a human being sees God, he is either confronted by his own sinfulness and almost faint from the realization of God's holiness, or he falls down at the feet of Christ or, or, or an angel as though he were dead. Right, yeah, and those have been the experiences in Scripture right. that Scripture talks about. But instead you have kind of a gentle heaven where, well, I shouldn't say it like that, probably not the right way to say it, but you have experiences where people are just kind of going into heaven and just, you know, having these experiences that, you know, uh, have real, you know, r- really uh, no no effect on them, at least bodily, as you see in the scriptures, like like Isaiah's experience. Yeah, uh, that's one of the more vivid descriptions, other than, than John in the Revelation. That's probably one of the most vivid ex- uh, descriptions of a human 
being in the presence of God in Scripture that we have. Let me just read Isaiah 6, 1 through 7 for a moment, can I? Sure, Danny, why not? <laughs> unless, I'm you, unless you want to read it. <laughs> no, no, thank you. Go ahead. And the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. Now this is what Isaiah saw. Um, he certainly did not see a Jesus and, and of course, John makes it very clear that what Isaiah saw was Christ in John chapter 12. So Isaiah did not see a Jesus that invited him up on his lap. But he saw a Jesus that was absolutely caused him to glorious. have... Yeah, glorious. To, it caused him and to have this reaction. And it, let, me, no let, let me go on with what he says. He says, what, when the... When those angels, when they were saying, holy, 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 listen to what happened. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, this is Isaiah's experience after seeing this. And I said, woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips. And I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the king the Lord of hosts. Now, here's what I, here's what blows me away. The word woe there is an oracle of judgment. When a yes. prophet would cry woe, he was doing that because he was pronouncing judgment on a people. But here, what Isaiah is doing is he is crying woe and pronouncing judgment on himself for what yes. he saw. Now, some might argue, well, you got to understand, Isaiah wasn't dead, he wasn't in heaven, he didn't have his glorified, you know, or glorified, he wasn't in a glorified state, uh, you know, he wasn't, he was still in his sinful body, so you would expect something like that. But the point is, when Isaiah saw the glory of God, it caused him to tremble, it caused him to fear, it caused him to quake, and it caused him to pronounce judgment on himself. Yeah, and that's that's a really good point that you bring that up. I think oftentimes in English we kind of miss those things, but when you really get back uh, and, and study some of these nuances in the language, we see things like that. Uh, uh, woe, you know, woe being a pronouncement of judgment. Well, you know, I'm such an expert in the biblical languages. I thought I might point. That well, I don't out. mean that, Dan. You don't. You don't have to be an expert. You don't have to be an expert to to know that. That's. I mean, but that's something when we're studying the Bible, we should know. Yeah. For example. Did you know that the word hallelujah is an imperative command to praise God? It comes from the Hebrew word uh, uh, for praise, and then the, the yah on the end is the abbreviated form of Yahweh. So hallelujah, hallelujah is, an, is a, an imperative command to praise God. And oftentimes we use that word and don't realize it, but that's the way it is in, in, in the scripture. But I, I focus again on, on Isaiah's reaction because it was, it, again, it was one of, of just awe and fear and trembling. And in comparison to those who supposedly see the great light and they go into this beautiful, warm, heavenly experience at their death, um, it just doesn't jive. Um, even, even Christians uh, who say that they you know, uh, go and come back. So let's, um, Stephen, let's talk about Don Piper for a minute. Let's let's put heaven is for real aside, and let's talk about Don Piper's 90 minutes in heaven. Now we know what happened. You know, he he was in a in a serious car accident. Car accident, yeah. And he ended up dying for 90 minutes, and or, or ended up dead for 90 minutes. He said he was clinically. He was actually. He said his arm was actually severed from his body and laying out, and he said that. You know, he was crushed. His head was crushed. And I guess um, a, 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 he, he was actually coming from a conference, uh, on his way home from a conference. And somebody else that had been at the conference was uh, coming up to the scene of the accident after it had happened. And uh, this man, I, I, I think, was a pastor. 
and he goes to the uh, to the to the police and the ambulance there. And he says, "Look, uh, God just or he, he does probably doesn't say God told me, but Piper says that God spoke to the man and said, pray for that man in that car.' So he talks his way over to the car and he begins to pray for." Don Piper, for 90 minutes, he's in that car praying for Don Piper, while Don Piper is experienced in heaven. Now, the amazing thing to me, the thing about this is Piper, uh, and not, not to confuse with John Piper, by the way. We don't want anybody to think that we're talking about John Piper. This is Don, D-O-N, Don Piper. Um, what, 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 I, I, what I think is amazing is he talks about getting to heaven or being at the pearly gates and people meeting him there at the pearly gates people who he knew uh from his 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 life that had died and gone before him um did you what what did you see Stephen? as as he was as, as he was describing that did, did anything go through your mind at all as he was describing those experiences with uh the people that had died and gone before him well, the main thing I remember him saying was that these were people that had a, had had a spiritual impact. But the yeah. way he, it seemed like he almost made sure that he described the fact that they didn't have physical bodies. Yeah. But yet, in the same breath, he said they mm. looked young. Right. They're the not old. The older ones looked younger, and the younger ones looked older. <laughs> uh, they were mature. Um, but they didn't have a corporal body. I mean, to me, that was a bit confusing. I don't know. Yeah, since the Bible says that we are not actually, if we die uh, before Christ returns, we're not actually going to have, we're going to be out of the body. Paul talks about being out of the body. He talks about uh, being uh, absent from the body and present with the Lord. So there's really nowhere in Scripture that talks about us having any kind of physical bodies if we die before uh, we get our resurrected bodies. Right, and, and I think he, he was kind of hinting at that, but at the same time, the way he described it was almost like they did have bodies. Uh, well, I read an interesting an interesting uh, article on Don Piper uh, on uh, on Don Piper's experience, and one of the things that this blogger said was when Piper talked about the streets of gold and the pearly gates. It, it was, it, it, the, the the thing is, is that that is in in Revelation 21, speaking of the New Jerusalem. That was so, the very first thing that crossed my mind. The very first thing I thought was, he's describing things that are supposed to take place after Christ's return and yeah. after the final judgment. Yep. Um, now, I sent you, uh, why don't you read Revelation 4, well, actually, uh, let me see here. Why don't you go to Revelation 21? Go to Revelation 21 in the, in the Bible there and read, uh, read for us, Revelation 21 in the in the New Jerusalem, and read it in context. Start in verse one and just go right okay, through the well, New, that's what New I, Jerusalem. That's, that's what I'm going to ask. What you want? What do you want to read it? Uh, John read it in says context. this. John says this. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And he who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I am making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of water of life without payment. The one who conquers will have this heritage, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for murderers, the sexually immoral, sorcerers, idolaters, and all liars... Their portion will be in the lake of lake that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. Do, how far do you want me to read? Uh, that's good enough. I just wanted. Oh, did, wait a minute. Did you uh, go down until you uh, until you see until it starts talking about the streets of gold and the pearly and the in the uh, twelve gates and you read all that, right? Uh, no, I didn't. Go. Uh, that's what I want you to do. I want you to get right down and 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 show that in the New Jerusalem, that's where you see the streets of gold. That's okay. where you see the twelve gates. 
Okay, then picking up at verse 9, Then came one of the seven angels, who had the seven bowlfuls of seven blast plagues, and spoke to me, saying, Come, I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain, and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God, its radiance, like a most rare jewel, like a jasper, clear as crystal. It had a great high wall with twelve gates, and the gates twelve angels, and on the gates of the names of the twelve tribes of the sons of Israel were inscribed. On the east three gates, on the north three gates, on the south three gates, and on the west three gates. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and on them were the twelve names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And the one who spoke with me had a measuring of gold to measure the city and its gates and walls. The city lies four square, its length, the same as its width. And he measured the city with his rod, twelve thousand stadia. Its length and width and height are equal. He also measured its wall, 144 cubits by human measurement, which is also an angel's measurement. The wall was built of jasper, while the city was pure gold like clear glass. The foundations of the wall of the city were adorned with every kind of jewel. The first was jasper, the second sapphire, the third agate, the fourth emerald, the fifth onyx, the sixth carnelian, the seventh chrysolite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, the tenth Chrysoprase, I guess is how you say it, the 11th J. Saint, the 12th Amethyst, and the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Each of the gates made of a single pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. There we go. So this is describing not heaven in the intermediate state, but the new Jerusalem when it comes down and when we are going to be able to dwell within that. Yeah, uh, I, I, I would imagine that the uh, intermediate state would be much more like Isaiah described it, uh, the throne room of God, the angels uh, hovering and flying with their with their wings covering their eyes, uh, proclaiming glories to God. So when you look at somebody's testimony of visiting heaven and they start talking to you about streets of gold and they start talking to you about the pearly gates – what you can do is take them over to Revelation chapter 21 and tell them, wait a minute, you're not describing heaven. You're actually describing the new Jerusalem. Yeah, and, and again, Danny, when he started talking about the streets of gold and the pearly gates, and because that was what the woman asked him, oh, did you see the pearly gates? And <laughs> he was like, oh, yes, immediately. And I, the very first thing that crossed my mind was, wait a minute. That is how the Bible describes the new Jerusalem. Not heaven, but Jerusalem. Exactly. So now let's talk about some biblical descriptions of heaven itself in the book of Revelation. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, I'm just the behind-the-scenes guy. You're, you're taking the lead on the podcast. No, no, no. Look, there's no behind-the-scenes here. You're, 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 you're right up front there. But, you know, when I think about heaven and when I, I, I look at the, um, the the book of Revelation and its description of the throne and, and, and what, uh, you know, what John saw, uh, it, it does not match with what you, you hear from these, tes these other testimonies. So I'm, I'm looking at Revelation chapter 4, verse 1 through 7, and uh, this is what it says. After this, I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. So we know he's describing heaven. He's not talking about the New Jerusalem here. He's talking about heaven. Right. And the first voice, which I heard speaking to me, was like a trumpet, said, Come up here, and I will show you what must take place after this. At once I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne stood in heaven, with one seated on the throne. And he who sat there had an appearance of jasper and carnelian. And around the throne was a rainbow that had the experience of an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones. And seated on the throne were 24 elders, clothed in white garments with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. Now that doesn't sound like... Um, somebody that you would want to jump up and sit on the lap. <laughs> that would be somebody you would fall on your face before in awe and worship. Yeah. Um, with golden crowns on their heads. From the throne came flashes of lightning and rumblings and peals of thunder. And before the throne were burning seven torches of fire, and there are seven, and they, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne there was, as it were, a sea of glass like crystal. And something else, Stephen, too. Um, 
that just dawned on me as I'm sitting here thinking about this. Remember when the disciples were arguing, arguing who was going to sit at the right hand of Christ? And Jesus said, it's not for me to determine, but it's, it's for my Father to determine. Yes. Now, so... Again, I'm, I'm going back to Heaven is for Real. I'm going back to Colton Burpo sitting in Jesus' lap. You know, I look at this picture here in Revelation chapter 4, and I, I think of what the disciples asked Jesus, and I can see right there that there's something really wrong with uh, Colton Burpo's story there. It, it, I'm not saying that he didn't have some sort of experience. But like you said, more than likely it was hallucinations or something under the anesthesia. I just do not see how the Scripture and his story, in other words, Scripture itself is going to, in my opinion, going to trump any experience whatsoever. I can't see... I can't see these experiences like Colton Burpo's experience um, even being real at all. When you look at this description in Revelation chapter 4, I just th- this description here is what blows my mind. Right. Well, Danny, even even with the fact when you read uh, further on or, or at the beginning, it says John was in the spirit. Uh, but later on, when you read, even in the spirit, he fell down as he was dead, as yeah. though he was dead. And, you know, you st- <sighs> got guys like Don Piper. and Now, I guess the case Don Piper could make or somebody in his defense would say, well, yeah, but he was really dead. So he was already in a glorified state, so he wouldn't have been like that. But at the same time, if his description is matching a future Jerusalem and not a current heaven, you know, how do those two jive? How do you jive those two? Right, right, exactly. Now listen to the rest of the verse, and around or the passage, and around the throne, on each side of the throne, are four living creatures, full of eyes in front and behind. The first living creature, like a lion; the second living creature, like an ox; the third living creature, with the face of a man; and the fourth living creature, like an eagle in flight. I mean, these these are just incredible descriptions. Why don't you hear about this? These kind of descriptions in their stories. Why don't you hear? Already in the Bible. What's, well, of course, but why don't you have them saying things like, "You, I just you would not imagine these creatures that I saw in the sea of glass and and just you know the the rumbles and lightning and thunder coming from the throne and I was in such awe." And one of the things that MacArthur made, John MacArthur made in his uh, articles uh, on Heaven Is for Real, is that all of these quote unquote experiences of people going to heaven. Focus on themselves, not on the glory of God and how awesome God is. It's all about, oh, look at the cool things I saw while I was in heaven. Look at the cool things I experienced. Not about the glory of God. Yeah, and that's a big telling point for me. But also, too, Danny, the real vision of heaven is not sensational enough, at least not sensational to sell. People want to hear about your experience. Mm-hmm. They, don't want to hear, they don't want to hear about the glory of God. Yeah, there's a lot of money to be made with a heavenly experience. Well, sure. Just ask ask uh, uh, Mary Kay Baxter. Is that her name? Uh, is she the is she the lady from Golden Girls? <laughs> no, the uh, divine <laughs> divine revelation of heaven, divine revelation of hell, divine oh, revelation yeah, yeah, okay, of the spirit okay. world. Yeah. Isn't go. that her name, Mary Kay I, Baxter? I couldn't. I don't remember. Whatever her name is, don't buy the books. That's that's, that's all I'm going to say. All right, Stephen, take Revelation chapter five, and and as you're and, and as you're reading this, I, this is the entire chapter. I want you folks to listen to the incredible descriptions here, and then compare these experiences or these descriptions. I'm sorry, to the descriptions that you see in these books written by people who have uh, had heavenly visions and experience trips to heaven right and also focus on the fact of where the focus of heaven is exactly then john says this he says then i saw in the right hand of him who was seated on the throne a scroll written within and on the back sealed with seven seals and i saw a mighty angel proclaiming with a loud voice who is worthy to open the scroll and break its seals And no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth was able to open the scroll or to look into it. 
And I began to weep loudly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll or to look into it. And one of the elders said to me, Weep no more. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has conquered so that he can open the scroll and its seven seals. And between the throne and the four living creatures, and among the elders, I saw a lamb standing as though it had been slain with seven horns and with seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. And he went and took the scroll from the right hand of him who was seated on the throne. And when he had taken the scroll, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders fell down before the lamb, each holding a harp and golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. Then I looked, and I heard around the throne and the living creatures and the elders the voice of many angels numbering myriads of myriads and thousands of thousands, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and might and honor and glory and blessing. And I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. What an amazing, amazing description. And one of the things, too, Stephen, that are missed, that are missing in these books and in these stories of people's experience in heaven is what's in this passage right here, the gospel. The gospel is missing. It's all about my experience, what I saw. And yet, what does it say? What are the angels and the elders praising Christ for? Because he ransomed by his blood people for, uh, for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and have made them a kingdom of priests of our God and they shall reign on earth. That is amazing. And the glory of God is the central focus right there in that passage of Scripture. Not the experience of John, but the glory of God. Yeah. And uh, again, like you said, it that's, that's what's missing. That's what's missing from these people's testimonies. Uh, you know, Don Piper mentioned about, uh, well, you know, I started speaking about this because I realized it, quote unquote, helped people. Well, how does it help people? You know, eternally, what's it going to do? Exactly. You know, how's that going to make a, how's that going to make a difference in somebody's life to say, hey, I went to heaven. Oh, that's cool. What did you see? And you tell them what they saw. And not only that, but what bothers me about his story and about the Heaven is for Real story with Colton Burpo is that Don Piper, let's start with Don Piper. Don Piper t says himself that he did not even mention this to anyone for quite a long period of time. It was a long while before he even said anything about his Heaven experience. And then what bothers me about the Heaven is for Real book, and I read the book, what bothers me about that book is the father, Todd Burpo, gets all of these stories from his son over about, I would say, a year and a half to two year, you know, uh, interval, intervals. You know, it's not, you know, it's not all at once. It's, it's, you know, he gets some pieces at a time and he finds out all this information over time. That bothers me. And it bothers me because I know how little kids are. You know, I know how kids are. I have kids. Um, they like to talk. And Todd Burper says, well, I, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to push him. But, you know, there would have been no issue about talking to his son about what he saw if, 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 if that was really, you know, his experience there. Yeah, I think you pointed out before, uh, not, not in this podcast, but when you and I were talking about it before, how the little boys supposedly saw all this fighting and swords, and and that's what little boys want to talk about. Yeah. They get excited talking about that. I mean, I know my son, uh, he's 11 now, but when he was that age, I mean, good night, man. He couldn't he couldn't see a toy sword without picking it up and yeah. fighting and wanting to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. So it just you know you you got to wonder. You have to wonder how much of this stuff 
was experienced by Colton and how much of this stuff was added to the story itself. You, you know, and, and again, we don't know. But it certainly, we can say this with, uh, with 100% accuracy. These stories, although they have, like, like Todd, Todd Burpo mentions, uh, talks about Scripture and tries to, tries to jive his son's experience with Scripture, they still do not match what we see in the Bible. They just don't match. It's all about what the experience was. It's not about the glory of God. There is no gospel in this. I think uh, uh, it talks about, uh, you know, Jesus in your heart and heaven is for real. And, you know, Colton, you know, is very concerned about people having Jesus in their heart. Well, what does that even mean? And where is the atonement? And where is the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin? Where is the wrath of God being taken out upon Christ in our behalf? None of that is 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 in this story. And that's that's the point. It doesn't match up with Scripture, and you know it should be a closed case. But unfortunately, too many people are seeking to have something sensational, something other than the quote-unquote boring Bible. Yeah. Uh, you said it at the beginning. They don't want to take time to, to, to sit down and read it because it takes work. And I'm going to tell you, Danny, as a pastor, it does take work. You have to put a lot of time, a lot of energy, a lot of effort into actually studying to yield any kind of uh, a reward from that. But I will tell you this, Stephen, though. In light of that, even the average, the Bible is written for anyone to get a hold of. So the average Christian, if they would just open up their Bibles and read four chapters a day, they'll go through the Bible in a year. Four chapters a day is all it takes. And that in and of itself could solve so many uh, issues when they hear a pastor say something that doesn't feel quite right. If they would just read the Bible, it's, all it takes is opening up the scriptures and reading them. That's what it takes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but, hey, you know, people want the 30-second devotional, man. And But, well, you know, again, it, it, it just goes right back to, to, the, to the pulpit. Yeah, it goes right. How, what are pastors doing? How are they holding up Scripture? Are, do they have a high view of Scripture, or do they believe that there are errors in the Bible? Do they believe that the Bible is the inerrant Word of God, or do they say, well, you know, um, it's scientifically, the Bible doesn't talk much about science, the Bible doesn't talk... You know, the, his, some of the historical things in the Bible are not right, which is bunk. It's garbage. But if you don't have a high view of Scripture and you don't put that out there to your people, well, your people are not going to have a very high view of Scripture either. And if you talk a lot about experience or you talk more about experiences and quote unquote gifts of the Spirit and, and spiritual experiences uh, of the Holy Spirit over and above Scripture, well, guess what? That's what your people are going to be talking about and thinking about. Yep, uh, that's absolutely right. Uh, pastors need to have a high view of Scripture. They need to pass that on to their congregation, but they need to encourage their people to read God's Word for themselves. Absolutely. Well, Steve, we're about out of time. Um, and uh, listen, folks, uh, just just an encouragement to you. And I, and, and I know Steve would say the same exact thing as I'm saying now to you. He, he Him and I would, would, would both be um, on the same page right here. The most important thing you can do is is open up the scriptures and check everything, everything that your pastor, no matter how godly he is, everything that we are saying, everything that you hear the TV preacher say, check it with the scriptures. See if it matches. Because, look, you don't have to believe Steve and I. And what Steve, is, Steve is agreeing with me right now. I see him nodding his head. Yes, I do. And uh, the, the point is, don't just believe what we say here. Open up the Bible. Read it. Look at these passages yourself. Google uh, words like heaven and see what the Bible says about it. Really look at the Bible and read the passages in context. That's And that's the most important thing. Uh too many people don't know the Bible, Danny. They don't they don't know it because they don't read it. And then when they hear something taken out of context, they don't realize it's been taken out of context. And what, the, the number one rule for interpreting Scripture is context. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Steve, it was good getting with you. And Lord willing, you and I will be able to get together again next week. And if not next week, very soon. I know you've got a lot of stuff going on. Uh, you've got some transitions going on in your church. 
and um, and uh, plus uh, I know your work schedule has really uh, gotten well. You, you've gotten a lot more added to your schedule than you than you have had in the past. Yep. yep. All right. That's right. All right, brother. Well, it was nice talking to you, and Lord willing, we'll get together again soon. All right. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of Long for Truth. I hope this has been an edifying podcast. If you'd like to contact us, you can always email us at longfortruth at gmail.com. That's longfortruth at gmail.com. We have received some encouraging emails from some of you. We thank you very much for that, and we will try to get uh, all of those emails answered as quickly as we can. You can also contact us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash longfortruth. Lord willing, we'll see you next time.